Welcome, viewers, wherever you are. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And uh, welcome to our panel members here. This is Jeffrey. Welcome, Jeffrey. And Norman. Welcome, Norman. Thank you for making this podcast with me. Now, the issue that we're going to address today is about the UK monarch, which is a bit like the two-headed dog of Greek mythology, Orthrus. And in our case, the monarch has one head that reigns over the state and the other head reigns over the church. Well, as you know, AUK is not party political, but our monarch is entangled with Anglicanism, the state religion, and we do object to a state religion. So let me just give a bit of background here. Pardon me while I give a bit of a history lesson for the benefit of our viewers. The, the coronation, it's steeped in tradition that confirms the intertwining of the monarchy and religion. It's a more than 1,000 year old ceremony which involves the anointing of the monarch who commits himself, in this case, to the people through sacred promises. And one of those is to uphold the Protestant religion. And that's a bit of a reminder of religious divisions in 500 years ago when the the title of defender of the faith sorry defender of the faith and supreme governor of the church of england was given by the grateful pope when uh, king henry the 8th rebutted the teachings of martin luther the, the german reformist so the thing is that after Henry decided to break with Rome, he still clung on to that title for himself as defender of the faith of Anglicanism. And he passed it on to his daughter, and who also dubbed herself Supreme Governor of the Church of England, saying that Jesus Christ was its head. That was Elizabeth I, of course. But to this day, the British monarch retains constitutional authority over the established church, although it doesn't govern it. Elizabeth II left that to her bishops, although she did address the general synods and maintained a role as a listener and guide to her primate, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, following her very sad death, that all passes to King Charles III. And he said some interesting things as recently as uh, yesterday, the 17th of September, when he was interviewed in the Bow Room at Buckingham Palace, when he said, I've always thought of Britain as a community of communities. That has led me to understand that the sovereign has an additional duty. It's less formally recognized, but to be no less diligently discharged. And that is the duty to protect the diversity of our country, including by protecting the space for faith itself and its practice through the religions, cultures, traditions, and beliefs to which our hearts and minds direct us as individuals. Well, that's the background. So guys, I'd like your views on some of this, starting with <clears throat> how valid do you think it is that somebody who by accident of birth is in the position to declare himself to be the English Pope. What do you think of that? It, well, well, I think if I, st I start with the history, it, it's re remarkable Ross Neck that what was defender of the Catholic faith became a defender of another faith in short order. It also shows the lack of strength of religion and faith that because as he, he, he wanted to marry another woman, that yes. overrode the faith and was more important than which religion or yes. in we practiced or more important than religion itself. So I suppose that's encouraging anyhow. Uh, uh, I, I mean, obviously it is not sensible for anybody to be made a pope just because he is made ki king 
and so that it would obviously be rejected by atheists. But it's also significant to say that <clears throat> there's a big change with, with Charles III compared to all the other monarchs, because every other monarch ascended the throne when in Britain was it's overwhelmingly a re religious country. There were probably 90% yes. of the people at the time of Elizabeth II's accession in 1953 who believed yes. in some religion. Now it is under 50% and atheists are, uh, or, and certainly agnostics, are a majority. Mm. So the king's position should be coloured by the fact that most people for the first time with the, reign, uh, with the beginning of the reign of a monarch, no longer believe in religion, and that should be taken into account. So when he says it's a community of, uh, of people, most of his community don't believe in any religion, and that should necessitate him ste stepping out of affirming the correctness is is or the state institution of religion, even if in the past the minority who didn't believe in religion weren't sufficiently protected. Now, most certainly, as we are a majority, it should be no part of the state. Absolutely. And I love the idea that sex trumped faith back then. Norman, what do you think? Can we have some views? Well, of course, no one would have got to this position if you were starting and trying to devise a rational way of organising matters. It's just grown historically. So I tend to accept it with the qualification that um, Geoffrey mentioned that um, we may come to uh, shortly, that um, there should be no blasphemy law in the country and that mm. atheists have as much right to be defended in their position as anybody else. Mm. I think we're going to come to that, if not. But that we is are. the most important thing that I um, would make out of all this. Thank so you. I hope that somehow that gets recognised eventually. Yes. In the of words that are used. Yes, well, this is one of the reasons we do these podcasts, to try and attract attention to our position. <clears throat> now, as I, as I said in my introduction, Charles himself has expressed the, the intention to become the defender of all the faiths. So how do you think he might go about that? What, what, how might the role change in future under him? Anyone want to speculate <laughs> on that? He doesn't seem to have to do very much in order to defend them because they're not being attacked in the way that they were historically. So um, I think we just uh, let it lie quietly. Yes, way. yes. Do you want to speculate on that, Jeffrey? Well, I expect he'll be visiting many more mosques and temples <laughs> as well as churches and cathedrals. But uh, it's important to, as I said before, to absolutely realise the majority don't believe in religion. In fact, probably most people have no interest in religion and he ought to be reflecting that f a fact. As, as far as I'm concerned, instead of being defender of faiths, he should more appropriately be defender of doubts, yes. uh, which would unite religion in, and religious belief if with atheist and agnostic views, because the very word faith is not knowledge. It, people have to have faith because it's not certain. It's yes. a matter subject to doubt. Now there's even more doubt. There's so many religions that are prevalent in this or existent in this country. So oh, rather than thinking of himself as defender of faiths, it would be better if he said, I'm defender of doubt, the right of, of people to, uh, to think believe, doubt, it, and and question, most importantly, question. And it's probably that can be extended to uh, uh, politics, science, and other dogma, as well as religious dogma. Keep to the subject. <laughs> 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 but you're, you're absolutely right. What we want is critical thinking and the recognition that there is no certainty 
and that these are just opinions. Faith is not evidence. I agree. Yes. So, but let's speculate. You said that supposing he starts visiting more mosques and uh, temples and uh, synagogues, how do you suppose the Archbishop of Canterbury might react to that? <laughs> Well, it just shows how far it's all moved from the original notion of defending one particular brand of religion. So I don't think the Archbishop can um, be very happy about it, but it's going to be difficult for him to object as well. So um, he'll just be fuming silently. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a picture of steam coming out of his ears. <laughs> Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury, like all the major religions now, are all for ecumenism. That's, I'd say, it's saying, well, it's a matter of faith, of different faiths in different countries, is that God exists in different forms. So I don't see that he, he could object that very much, apart from which the modern fashion for Arch Bishop of Canterbury is, isn't it, is to stick their foot into politics yes. uh, rather than to uh, uh, vigorously defend and, and propagate any religious view. Yes, well, I, their ecumenism, that's not really working within their faith, let alone <laughs> between their faith and other faiths. I don't know whether you heard the news, but... Uh, the Anglican Church of Australia has recently split into two. <laughs> they have a big disagreement over attitudes towards uh, LGBTQ marriage and, and blessings. So they've decided they can't, they can't stand each other, basically. <laughs> so what, 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 something we've touched on already here. We are now in a country that polled 51% nuns, not not the ladies in Wimples, but N-O-N-E-S, nuns. So, as you suggested, <clears throat> maybe the monarch should be the defender of, the, of doubt, but I'd like to suggest a title for him might be Defender of the Faithless. <laughs> <laughs> so, should we propose that as a, 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 an Im improvement on his current title? Well, I, I'd rather that he... he were de defender of doubt. I, I mean, in the they've got a further problem because it's only in the past uh, uh, as Charles hasn't been a very committed Anglican and has preferred it wandering around the world for his religion. He was very friendly with the Dalai Lama and I think yeah. quite sympathetic to that theological or atheological view of the old, old Pope. Pope yeah. John Paul II denied that Buddhism is a religion, which really has good grounds to do. But it, certainly Charles seemed rather sympathetic to that worldview rather than a narrow Anglicanism. But at, at the end of the day, he, he, he should, well, he can give up the title of defender of anything to begin with, but if he is <laughs> defender of anything, it should be doubt. Yes, okay. Do you want the last word on this, Norman? <laughs> Defender um, of the faithless? I would prefer doubt, but um, yep. okay. I don't Defender think, I can't believe that that would actually ever come about. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Defender of doubt would really be quite an innovation for a moment. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. Watch this space. Guys, that's it. Thank you very much. We've done a 15-minute show, and it was brilliant. Thanks to you. I'm going to play the outro now. Bye-bye.